Uh, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon from uh, wherever you are joining us uh, today. Uh, we would like to welcome you to this uh, uh, episode of the Africa Football Business Show. We apologize for the slight delay. It was due to some uh, technical hitches, but uh, we are good to go uh, now. Um, today's uh, topic is uh, the role of uh, media in football enterprise uh, development. And uh, we, are pleasure, we have a privilege to be joined by uh, Dr. Gerard uh, Akindes and uh, Asha Komogisha, who will be joining us uh, later. Uh, and uh, before, we, we, before we proceed, just like to take a moment to appreciate, first of all, our, our partners. That is uh, OTB Africa, uh, Palmas, and uh, Sea Beyond Leadership Forum. And uh, this particular series uh, is being done in uh, collaboration with uh, Sports Legal. Uh, to move uh, straight ahead, uh, maybe it's, uh, as usual, we want to introduce our guest. They should be guests now, but uh, Asha will be joining us uh, with apologies from her. So we'll start with you, uh, Dr. Akinde. It's just, uh, it's not your first time here, but uh, for our viewers, uh, we'd like to know more about you and your interest in football and this particular topic of uh, of the media. Uh, hello, uh, hello, Brian. Brian. Thank me for, thanks for having me here. Again, this is a pleasure to be back. Uh, my, about myself, I'm originally from Benin, where I was born and I raised. Uh, I played basketball mostly in Benin, Togo and Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, had a, a some years, a few years in uh, in Belgium where I coach basketball before going to study in, uh, in the US. I study sport administration and my final degree is in media studies. One of the reasons why I'm here is to talk about uh, broadcasting, which is a field of been researching on and working on one of the areas I had some I have some interest in, and uh, wrote mostly about uh, television broadcasting on in sport and predominantly football in Africa. This is one of my areas of focus in my research. Uh, not all the time, but currently I, I've done a few pieces on. Uh, broadcasting and television in, in Africa, and mostly football. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gerard, for that uh, introduction. And uh, really, uh, we couldn't have uh, asked for, uh, for a better guest in, uh, in this subject of uh, the media and its role uh, in football enterprise uh, development. Uh, so just to get started, it's been uh, almost half a century since uh, television arrived uh, on the continent. Um, can you just tell us some of the, the, the key developments that uh, you've observed through your, your research that are worth noting, especially when it comes to uh, interaction with sports and, uh, and football? Uh, yes, it's about uh, television really started the continent in this. I'd say it depends on the country. Uh, 50 years is, uh, I consider it's a relatively new media for Africa compared to the rest of the world, especially the, uh, the Western part of the world. It's a new media which took time to establish itself. It was initially dominated by government-owned uh, television. It was just one channel. Uh, controlled by the government, and uh, from the late 80s, I the early 90s, the if two factors really transformed the media scape and how television was going to operate on the continent. It's uh, privatization under the pressure of uh, social adjustment programs mostly, and also democratization and then uh, we had some technological uh, changes around the overall world of uh, television broadcasting. It was, it was global. 
but Africa lived through this transformation differently because uh, we were not really uh, in charge of the main transformation, which is uh, satellite, satellite uh, television, and Africa was suddenly exposed to the world. And from the sport perspective, I'll say uh, it was very welcome in the sense that suddenly we could watch live games uh, from uh, mostly European leagues. We could be more exposed to every every week, every day, football, Olympics, World Cup, uh, any competition in the world. What wasn't the case before uh, through satellite? If not satellite directly to your home, it was at least our broadcasters had satellite access and could broadcast some of this competition directly to us. Uh, the other element, it uh, exposed us to our players who were playing in Europe. We could see them more consistently playing their games and uh, that added some value to how we we watch football, we watch uh, sport in general. And it had some other challenges, but I'll say it opens the world to us. Uh, and it also exposed the world to African football because uh, the African Cup of Nations was uh, broadcast across the globe. So if people were discovering African players playing on the continent and that satellite help to to create that environment and also uh, the privatization also helped because it brought more uh, television broadcasting to sport and to uh, federation to be able to show the game to everyone okay so th th there's some very very positive uh, uh, developments uh, around around television but uh, we know it's not uh, media is not just uh, television and uh, even before that probably had uh, radio we had uh, newspapers and people were interacting with sports through these other media uh, how did television change uh, the the dynamics around these interactions with other media specifically radio and television or oh, radio was uh, the, the main uh broadcaster we used to listen to everything on radio and uh, radio mostly this uh, bbc radio france international they they are the one who had this uh, the short wave they are the one who had this uh, global projection of their their programs across the continent but uh, economically radio wasn't much involved in bringing money into sports. Uh, and uh, although it is the case today, when we look at some of the, the countries, especially the US, radio brings money to sports. Uh, but at that time, it wasn't the case. Radio was an element that was helping people to follow their teams, to follow the, the sport they love. Uh, television changed the game, and mostly the privatization and uh, new broadcaster satellite uh, it was uh, it was a revolution for sports because suddenly many more broadcasters could enter a space through satellite broadcasting and be, be become like a national broadcaster because they could uh, bid on competition that were not in their original uh, state or or nation uh, this happened in Europe with uh, uh, Sky. Uh, Sky went to bid on the English Premier League. That was a game changing economically. And television had brought that power. And television also brought the ability to project a game to the whole globe through satellite, because satellites were all over. And through the technology, which is complex, I, I don't know all the details, the intricacies, but you can be in. Uh, South Africa and have a game in uh, watch a game played in US or in England or in uh, anywhere on the planet because of satellite and suddenly the ability to do that brought to one sport or one game a much larger audience nothing could have uh, been able to attract 
And that's where the economic dynamic was established. And that was it's really going to transform how media interact from a business perspective with, uh, with sports and with football mostly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what uh, television did was really expand uh, the audience, but uh, what happened uh, exactly in uh, in Africa, for example? How did this transformation? How was this transformation experienced in Africa, especially in knowing how um, uh, what do you call the pen penetration of uh, of television uh, across the continent uh, compared to radio uh, in this regard? And you have brought in a very important uh, aspect: the business aspect. Uh, that came with the arrival of television. All of a sudden, it was big business, and television was providing sports, football, with much needed uh, capital. How was this experienced in Africa? Uh, Africa has a different experience. Uh, the first experience for Africa uh, was more political. It was a breakthrough of the break of uh, government monopoly on television. That's really what it was. But the, uh, because Africa wasn't producing the technology, that's one element. Africa wasn't producing most of the, the, the sport content that was shown on television. Africa slowly but quickly became a consumer. And this is very important. Africa just became a consumer of what was on television, mostly football in Europe. And that added a, a new dynamic to African football and African sport in general, because at, as a consumer, uh, the English Premier League became almost national league for a lot of Africans. They were watching it every weekend. Uh, the penetration of television was low. True, it's still one of the lowest on the, on the globe today. But because people wanted to watch it, they, they developed ways to watch their games. And this kiosk, what they call kiosk, or what they call bars, some places, we show the game and people will come around one TV, you have uh, 50, 100 people. It wasn't just in the household. It was more a public viewing of, uh, of football uh, in the bars. I think in Nairobi, they call them kiosk. In some places, it was movie theater. But Africans managed to watch the game in numbers. And without the full penetration of television, especially satellite television, which is, was at that time early, even till now, <laughs> relatively expensive for the common uh, African, they will manage to watch it collectively. Then the penetration that is not in the numbers in terms of television sets was still good enough for a lot of people who love football to watch football. But it was consuming European football. That brought European football on the continent, I say mostly European, uh, and created a level of competition with local football. Mm -hmm. So, uh, prior to this, because uh, you have, uh, in some of your work, you have even mentioned that uh, football itself, sport, is something we, we, we got from uh, the, 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 the colonial era. And the fact that you're saying we continued with this uh, consumption of, uh, of European football, how has this affected now the, the development of African football, especially as a business? And what do you see? What what has changed in the in the recent uh, past? Uh, I, it affects. I'm, I'm not sure how it affects it in sense that uh, negatively or positive. Positively, yes, people watch. They are exposed to much football. People love football. They can enjoy beautiful football. They can enjoy beautiful production because that is a critical element of watching. Uh, sport on TV, uh, you watch a, a big game, your uh, UFA Champions League, a, a big uh, EPL game, English Premier League game, you enjoy it on TV. Uh, that is a, 
that is a fact that we enjoy. But from the African football itself, I'll say the impact, if there's any impact, it's mostly negative. Uh, it's mostly negative because we have to compete with that football in terms of scheduling anyway. <laughs> and also, when we look at the new generation, new people getting into football, uh, the way they introduced to football today is mostly through these games from European football. English Premier League, the Spanish League, the French League, the German League, or the Italian League. So that's a big one, the big five. People enjoy watching these games and they become what, uh, how they connect to football. Their local leagues, their local teams don't mean much anymore. I won't say that it's just because of television or because of uh, European football. It's also because we, are, we leave the field open because our football didn't develop and to, to match the demand of people. Uh, our clubs didn't grow new followers as much as they, would, they should have to allow people to follow them and not being after uh, European football that much. It, it was a conjunction of factors. It's satellite television came in, and this is very important for from my analysis. When satellite was coming in, it was also the moment where uh, structural adjustment program were hitting African nations and governments where disinvestment in sports, in anything uh, related to social uh, activity of society was happening. Then when satellites and we were getting used to European football and all this international sport, we were also losing our investment in our local sport. And the space was slowly occupied by the sport coming from outside when we were dropping what we used to do. The popular clubs, we didn't have food money anymore. It was, it was a conjunction of factors that created that uh, uh, I'll say occupation of uh, the space and even the imaginary of African today in terms of football is completely true. This European football is what is, uh, I won't say it's sad, but it's difficult for, for African football now to compete against this, uh, the, the, big, the big brother. Thank you, Gerard. So we just, we just would like to welcome uh, Asha. Thank you for, for, for joining us. And uh, we'll, I think we'll throw you straight, uh, straight in. Maybe you can just do a quick introduction and uh, before we go into some questions. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you very much uh, for having me. Obviously, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Asha Komgisha. I'm from Uganda. I'm a multimedia football journalist um, specifying in uh, African football and very, very passionate about it also as well. Uh, a lot of uh, women in football um, news and, and, and features and, and uh, all of that. Um, it's an honor to be here and uh, I'm very glad that, you know to hear what uh, Dr. Akindes has to say about uh, the development of uh, uh, media over the years and how it affects uh, African football. Uh, great, Asha. So uh, just from, uh, from your uh, observation now, you, you know, sports and media have a very rich interaction, if you can say that. They're pro providing each other with, uh, with capital, with content uh, and, uh, and engagement. Um, what, what has been your observation uh, in Africa in um, in the time you have worked within the the, the, the sports uh, industry how how is this interaction maybe compared to other markets in the developed economies well africa from a media point of view you can say is divided into three and i say that best on television uh, because when you look at uh, who owns the tv rights and who owns the marketing rights um, you can say that right now be in uh, is in charge of the north african zone you have uh, uh, Canal Plus, as they say in uh, French, that is uh, covering the francophone speaking part of Africa. And then you have Supersport doing um, 
uh, majorly uh, work in uh, the Anglophone uh, and English speaking countries in Africa. Now, this uh, controls a lot of the vibes um, and a lot of uh, the, the, the sense of direction uh, that people are following football. When you look at North Africa, which I have uh, covered intensively, especially Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia, not Algeria as much, and Libya, even though Libya now is coming back into um, the essence of uh, hosting uh, international games, you see that there's a culture to it. Um, and this has been ongoing uh, from, from the years past. So because football in these countries, especially in North Africa, is not just a game, it's not just 90 minutes. It's about the culture of the people. In some of these countries, when you look at, for example, Tunisia, Esperance de Tunis um, was the reason Tunisia got independence. You know, uh, When you look at Al Ahli and Zamalek, they're not just football clubs, they're, they're cultures. You're talking about six generations of uh, football fans in one family. So this helps a lot um, to an extent that the media actually has to give uh, the population content, football content, otherwise they will go down. So it's the football that comes first and the other way around. Now it's different when you come to sub-Saharan Africa, whether English speaking or um, uh, uh, French speaking, that we have concentrated so much on European football where our big players uh, are playing and that we think that if you play in Europe, then you're the greater football player. Uh, when you look at players, you know, like, um, uh, you know, from Zambia, from uh, Uganda or Kenya that are playing, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you 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 think that uh, maybe they're not big enough because they're not played in Europe. When you look at a player like Rainford Kalaba, you know, one of the greatest Zambian players uh, to ever come out from that country. Uh, but because, for example, Patson Daka is playing uh, in Austria for Salzburg, you'll say, mm, you know, he's playing at the bigger stage. But what makes that stage bigger than the African stage? Is it that everything European is better than everything African? You know, so these are some of the conversations that we need to have. And the media is playing a very, very key role in directing that conversation. When you look at Ghanaian football right now, uh, they've gone back to the drawing board and they're using a hashtag on uh, Twitter that is saying we're bringing back the love. So the hashtag is bringing back the love. And you're seeing there's a lot of online content every day. Uh, you know, Asante Kotoko fans are fighting with the uh, Hats of Oak fans uh, every day. Who is signing who? Who has more fans in the stadium? When they're playing the derby, it's, it's you know, it's, it's people are going crazy on social media. When you look at uh, down south, obviously you have the derbies, you have uh, uh, Kaiser Chiefs playing Orlando Pirates, but you have the introduction of clubs like Mamelodi Sundowns that is saying, look, we're going to be part Um, at that level, you know, and, and make a point. Then you have Tanzania. Tanzania, Africans, th these clubs, Yanga, which is Young Africans and Simba, are part of the history, the political history of the country that is Tanzania. But you also have upcoming ones like Azam. Uh, Azam, who, yes, have a television and are using that to work hand in hand, uh, the TV company and the football uh, club, uh, you know, to move together and say, we're going to grow. Uh, together and change the narrative that it's not just about Yanga and Simba in Tanzanian football. We also have a team like Azam. Um, so it's 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 a little bit um, different from country to country, but also you have some of the countries where uh, in Africa um, we, we are still doing a lot of European football, and it's down to the media. I say I blame the media because. We are the ones that change the narrative. We are the ones that drive uh, people to talk about certain things. So now you have a lot of social media um, th that is driving the cause as well. And you have the clubs and you're saying the clubs, can they drive their own content? If I give an example of Uganda, uh, FUFA, which is the federation in Uganda, they have their own uh, radio station. And on this radio station, which is 24 hours, they are talking about their programs, they are hosting uh, players, they, they are making sure that they are in the faces of uh, everyone in the country and communicating every day about Ugandan football. So that helps because they are generating their own content. You cannot say we are just uh, basing on um, the newspapers and the televisions, otherwise they'll run their own narrative. Uh, so from that perspective, I feel that uh, from country to country, but sometimes the countries are also the same. 
for example, if you look at uh, Cote d'Ivoire, which is Ivory Coast, you can see that uh, ASEC Mimosas has gone down. There's uh, some clubs that are coming up, the newer ones. Um, but in other countries as well, it's the original big names, like in Mali, you have Stade Malien, you have Joliba, uh, still the same clubs that we know from Mali that have the good academies that are producing world-class athletes. Uh, it's, it's interesting right now. I mean, if you go and look world over in Spain, in Germany, uh, all the players that are coming from Mali, are coming from those two clubs, Stade Malien and Joliba. So sometimes it's the same, but sometimes it's a little bit different. Um, and the media really, the local media are, I should say, to blame or to thank. Because finally, I talk about South Africa. When South Africa got independence in 1994, the South African media space, they committed their lives and they said, we are going to give everything to promote our own football here in South Africa whether it be uh, radio stations or television stations or you have uh, the newspapers, everyone decided to go local. And the emergence of Supersport really, really helped a lot of um, uh, the PSL because right now you have the PSL broadcasting in up to 42 countries on the African continent. So the media can drive that space and say, we're going to focus on our local football and we're going to sell it. So whether uh, Manchester City is playing against Bayern Munich and uh, Kaiser Chiefs is playing Amazulu, people are going to be watching Kaiser Chiefs and Amazulu because that's the team they support or that's the, that's the team they don't like, so they want to support their opponents. Uh, so things like that. It's really down to the media at the end of the day, and I agree with uh, uh, everything that you've been saying. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, great, uh, great, great examples, very practical uh, uh, examples of what uh, the media has done, both uh, positive and, uh, and negative. Just to stay with you uh, a bit more, one thing I have, uh, uh, or rather I have mentioned is the issue of, of capital. And uh, you have mentioned the three big players in the Africa football industry, that being uh, Bain Sport, uh, Canal Plus, and, uh, and Super Sport. These are the ones who we can say have um, continental uh, control, and uh, recently we have also seen uh, Star Times trying to get into the into the same space. Uh, what has been their investment? Because this is what we are looking to do. Media can provide football with investment with capital. How much have they invested in developing African football vis-à-vis -vis probably showing us uh, European or foreign content? That's a very good question, Brian, because when you look at BEIN, you know that the Qataris have money. Um, they've been looking to use uh, sports diplomacy as a way of selling their country. That's why they are hosting the World Cup. Um, when you look at uh, the Qatar um, Olympic Committee calendar right now for the year 2021, you will see over 100 events. So for them, uh, this is a very big deal uh, that they're investing in sports broadcasting. And if you know also that BEIN is uh, a breakaway, I should say, of Al Jazeera, um, that they just got the Al Jazeera sports department and said, look, we could actually go into TV rights and all of this. Uh, they big top dollar. Uh, they, they pay a lot of money to, for example, the Confederation of African Football to buy rights for the Africa Cup of Nations, the African Nations Championship, which is the CHAN, the CAF Champions League. Um, and we're talking a, a lot of money, almost uh, $200 million dollars uh, that they are spending to broadcast that. But that money comes back to them. Why? Because every North African country has two teams in each of the inter-club competitions. So you have eight, uh, ten actually, ten, uh, ten teams. So two from Morocco, uh, two from uh, Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, and Egypt that are making it to uh, the you know preliminary round of these competitions and normally you will find that in the quarterfinals you have about six or seven of these teams when you look at uh, the semi-finals of the CAF champions league uh last year last season all of them were from north africa two from morocco and two from egypt if you look at the semi-finals of the confederation cup three of them were from north africa and just horoya from guinea so that money comes back to them. So we're talking $200 million minimum that they're spending on uh, CAF tournaments. Uh, same applies for Canal Plus, because if you look at, um, for example, it's a French company, you know, if you look at uh, France and Belgium, 
most of their players are coming from the francophone speaking part of the African continent. So actually, without African players playing in Europe, they don't have business. So almost the same amount. Now for Supersport, Supersport has tried to uh, show some local leagues. Uh, you know that they were in Kenya, they were in um, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Uganda as well. Uh, and, and they decided to pull out for certain reasons, uh, different for each of those countries. Uh, but they've since gone to Ethiopia. Uh, this season, they are showing the Ethiopian uh, Premier League. They've continued to show uh, the Zambian League and renewed the contract. And of course, the PSL. Now, the business is a little bit uh, complicated because, for example, you should think that they would be in Nigeria, uh, a country with 200 plus million people. Uh, that's a very big audience. But from a money perspective, when the Nigerian uh, government decided to uh, ask DTV to transact in dollars, it became complicated for Supersport to show the league. Why? Because you have a scenario where uh, when they were negotiating the deal, a dollar was about 170 naira. And right now you're talking about a dollar is up to 500 maybe or 476 naira. So this kind of business is not good for uh, DSTV and they're trying, but it's not easy. It's not easy to make money again, back to what you were talking about earlier with Dr. Gerard, the Premier League, especially the Premier League, La Liga and the Bundesliga. These leagues are spending a lot of money to market themselves on the African continent. Every now and then you will see that countries have signed deals with the La Liga, uh, you know, I don't know, to have academies or things like this, but, it, but we're not doing the same. For example, the KPL. The KPL is not going out to say, can we sign a deal with uh, uh, the Senegalese League? Can we open an academy in Senegal? You know, if you ask yourself, um, are people in Senegal aware about Gomahia? If you ask yourself, do uh, Ugandans know um, Setif, you know, in Algeria? Do they know about Tengweth in, in Senegal? So we need to have a space where everyone knows what's happening in the other country, not just online, but also television-wise. So it's a little bit uh, complicated right now. Hi. Uh, your, 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 th your thoughts on this, uh, uh, Gerard, especially with regards to African countries consuming content from other African countries. From my experience, this, we could only achieve this probably through uh, Super Sport. Uh, that's how now we are able to watch the, the, Ethiopian, uh, the Ethiopian League. That's how PSL has become very popular in, uh, in, Ke in Kenya. Um, how does this contribute to the to the growth of the football industry? And especially now we have the Africa free, continental free trade area that we are being encouraged uh, to have a united Africa to trade more uh, within ourselves. What does this uh, mean for the, for the media landscape uh, in sports? Uh, I think uh, super sports have been doing a uh, and if make a, a strong effort to, to support some of the local leagues. And as Usha said, they were in Zambia, Tanzania, Uganda, Nigeria, Ghana. Uh, but from what I've learned also, uh, there's a, an economic equation that we cannot escape. Uh, investing in sports for broadcasters is not uh, philanthropic. They, they, they have to make money back. And the money back depends on, first, it depends on how many subscriptions, one is pay TV, how many uh, subscriptions they get for super sport is how many people who subscribe to DSTV. That's what matters first for them. Uh, and then the second thing is how much advertiser they can get because they have a large audience for what they broadcast. These are the two main factors for them. This is where the money is going to come from. Uh, and when they make an effort on the continent, the response from African football is not always strong in terms of the audience they get on watching the games. Uh, and second, advertisement, because the popularity of the games is not very attractive if the audience is not there, because advertisement is connected to how many people are watching the game. 
the fact that super sports uh, and DSTV are say they are South Africans, but they have this uh, continental reach. It's very good because they they try. They they are still doing it at some extent. It helps some of the leagues to have a continental reach. Uh, but is it sustainable? Sustained? It's a uh, games from Zambia. Are they watched elsewhere? Or are they just watched by Zambian who are in uh, South Africa and or, or elsewhere on the continent? This, these are the, the big questions. That's why it's so difficult, even with the, uh, the free trade agreement, to change that dynamic because satellite television that didn't need free trade agreement. It needed just the regulation of uh, broadcasting and, and media policies to operate as free trade. Uh, but I'm not sure if it's going to really change the game from that point of view. In terms of capital, uh, because broadcasters need these viewers, uh, the, the state of African football today, especially on the sub-Saharan part of African football, is such a way that clubs are not the biggest club. Clubs can make a change and can drive some of this uh, capital. If you look at Ghana, Ashanti, Kotoko, Hatsofo, uh, Asek in Cote d'Ivoire is struggling, but can always bounce back because they have an <coughs> issue. Uh, some of the newest clubs for me, uh, that's where the risk is, because to be able to build a broad, uh, a, a large followers, it's, uh, it's difficult and it takes time. It takes long to become a, a popular club to develop a, a fan, fandom that is substantial. Having a fandom is not the most important. It's to have it substantially large to be able to become also a consumer of uh, broadcasting, which is going to attract media or broadcasters. That's where the, the challenge is. Uh, that's where African sport, African football is struggling. How do we bring people to games? How do we bring people in front of the screen to watch what we do? And uh, that's really where the, the, the challenge is for, for African football. And capital is not going to come. It's what comes first. Is it capital? Is it uh, fund? Or is it fund before capital? I think it's fund before capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you've had I, I, I that. Sorry, I, I want to sorry, say something, uh, to say Dr. Something. Gerard, about what you just said um, when you talk um, about capital and, and that TV. And I, yes, I, I was yeah, just I, saying I, that... Uh, when you talk about TV broadcasting being a business, uh, that's a very important point, especially I would say from a super sport point of view that super sport and DSTV are trying to sell decoders. So they're asking themselves, if we stop airing the Kenya Premier League, are Kenyans going to stop subscribing and paying their TV subscription? And they realize that the answer is no. Same applies for Nigeria and Ghana, that if um, they stop airing the league, from a financial point of view, people are still going to buy the decoders because you have Dede Ayu, you have, uh, at the time, Christian Atsu playing in the Premier League, um, and also the fact that, for example, you have players like Victor Wanyama that are playing in the Premier League uh, at the time. Uh, so Kenyans, you know, because of that, every week they know we're going to watch Victor Wanyama on television and let's subscribe because this is our homeboy, for lack of a, a better word. And and when you think about it uh, from a marketing perspective, uh, Dr. Gerard said something about it earlier. Uh, this is why in the Premier League, they're signing uh, Argentinian players, Spanish players, German players, so that they can attract the audience from that perspective. Because if, for example, Dennis Onyango is playing in the PSL, as a Ugandan, I want to watch Mamelodi Sundowns playing every weekend because I know this is my national team captain, you know. Now I'm starting to follow um, the Turkish league. I don't speak Turkish. I don't even know what they're saying in the commentary. But because Farouk Mia is playing there, I'm following. 
even myself even, here, because uh, Patson Daka is a player that I've seen, uh, you know, from when he was 15 years. I'm watching uh, Red Bull Salzburg um, as they play every weekend because I like this player and I like the way he has grown over the years. So, you know, things like that, that, for example, when KRC uh, Genk um, in Belgium signed Buana Samata, they had about 800 followers on Instagram. If you go to their Instagram right now, they are almost reaching maybe 1 million followers. Just Instagram. And because you're talking about a player like Mwana Samata who has 2 million followers on Instagram. So our leagues in Africa are not thinking outside the box. When they're investing money, when people are investing in football clubs, they want to um, just say, oh, you know, let's sign this player. He's very good on the pitch. But what about his reach? Uh, on social media? What about the player's reach uh, in his country? You know, what kind of player is he? When you look at a club like Horoya, that's that's a club that is thinking, you know, signing a player like Aristide Bans. The guy is a small god in Burkina Faso. Uh, the minute you sign him, everyone is trying to say, oh, uh, what's happening in Horoya this weekend? What are they doing? You know, um, so, so things like that. And, and now clubs in Europe understand that you need to sign, for example, an Egyptian player. Egyptian players on social media have minimum 3 million followers maybe 1 million or 1.5 on Instagram, another 1 million on Twitter, on Facebook, you have about 2 million or 5 million, whatever. Because the audience that is Egypt is 100 million eyeballs. And that's why, for example, Liverpool is not playing games. If they have any ze like zero content about Salah, they'll just throw it on social media because they know the minute Egyptians read the word more Salah, that's a retweet. You know, that's a view that you have. And already just in Egypt, you have one mi 100 million people. And that's just the ones in Egypt. What about the other Egyptians across the world? So these are some of the things that our clubs are not thinking about that they need to put in play uh, when they are uh, doing, uh, you know, business or signing players on the pitch. Yes, the player has got to be good on the pitch, but what about his reach on the outside from a business point of view? Okay, so it uh, it feels like uh, what, whatever is happening on the on the sporting. I have an echo, but I uh, hope that uh, goes away. Anyway, yeah, it feels like uh, yeah, what ha whatever happens on the sporting side really controls the uh, the media uh, media intention. As uh, Gerard was saying, you need the fans before the media can come in. But I also feel, especially as Africa, we have a role to play in pushing our own content. For example, what uh, what you just mentioned happened in South Africa, where they made a, a very intentional uh, effort to cover their own sport and to promote their own sport. That in itself is a, is an investment uh, that they made without really knowing um, uh, the returns or, or how uh, how it will be. But we see where the PSL is. Can other countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, emulate this and can super sport, for example, support the same in other African countries? Uh, Gerard. Uh, I, I think they, they've tried. We have to give them that they tr they've tried to, to support uh, football in other African countries. Uh, I had a conversation with one of the super sports person. He told me, uh, we, in Nigeria, for instance, we try, but it's just difficult. And it's just difficult because they, they have to deal with a league. And the league is not up to working with broadcasters in terms of capacity, in terms of uh, uh, equipment. He told me if I, I, I buy rights of the English Premier League of most of European uh, uh, leagues, I just uh, connect, I just get the feed. I don't have to produce a game myself. I don't have to go uh, check the cameras and do all these uh, technical elements. I just pro I just get the feed and broadcast the, the content. But when you go to Africa, they have to do almost, I think the experience in Ghana and in Kenya was about that, where they work very hard with Kenyan league. They, they really work hard 
to bring up the whole production, to bring up the whole league to a certain level that it had some broadcasting value. They achieved it, but it wasn't sustainable, I think, in terms of investment for them. And then they, they pull out at some point. Uh, what is, is great? And I think uh, the effort is to not enter just a business relationship. It's just to enter a partnership. We have almost naturally storytelling capacity. Uh, Usha is, is a journalist. We talk, we tell stories. This is something we do almost naturally. But we haven't been able to tell the story of ourselves. We don't do it. And in sport, it's the same. We can tell stories of ourselves. We can tell a story of our young players in the neighborhood when we have some little competitions. We can build our own interest in ourselves. And my thinking is not about having millions of followers. It's not 10 millions, because we also have to be realistic in terms of market, in terms of interest, in terms of cultural connection, in terms of sociological connection with all these players or all these teams. But at the same time, we can expand from where we are to at least what, what we can reach. And that component, that's what we have to develop. And broadcasters and leagues and clubs, they need to work together. The, the uh, media is not going to make money out of uh, a poorly run league. A poorly run league is not going to make money out of a poorly run uh, media. They have to work together to grow and think more in terms of partnership. And then they will start making the revenue they, they, they all need, they all can use, but separately entering competition with each other because they want to make money, the, the league wants much money from the a broadcaster who is not going to make money out of what they produce. It, it doesn't make any sense. Um. Just to say something, uh, Dr. Gerard, um, one of the things I have seen in Africa and especially in sub-Saharan Africa is that our clubs don't have an identity. You see, when you talk about uh, Borussia Dortmund, when you talk about um, Leipzig, when you talk about uh, Manchester United, when you talk about uh, Liverpool or Arsenal, Chelsea, these are clubs that have built an identity. But in Africa, uh, if you look at, you know, the leagues, like the names of the leagues, for example, it's uh, maybe a name of a company or it's a, it, it's a name of, uh, I don't know, a corporate company. It doesn't really have an identity. Like, what do you tie it down to? Because that's the way you build numbers. Uh, if I look at Uganda, we have a new club uh, that has been born maybe uh, 10 years ago. Uh, 11 years ago, actually, to be exact. And they are a club that is in West Nile, which is in the northwestern part of the country. And it's really down to, I should say, a tribe uh, or the people of Arua and West Nile. And because of that, the people in that area, they identify themselves with that club. And, and because of that, they feel that, okay, when are we buying the jerseys? When can we, when are we playing next? What's our calendar like? Um, when is our next away game? How do we go? Uh, you know, so things like that. Now, when you say that uh, African clubs, are they trying to do something about it? Are they trying to identify themselves? Um, and how are they marketing themselves? You know, uh, I really, really struggle. And trust me, I travel a lot across the African continent to find clubs that actually have merchandise shops we are in the middle of a pandemic fans are not allowed in stadiums so how else are you going to make money as a club if you don't even have a merchandise shop you're unable to do online um you know engagement with your fans you're not able to sell shirts how can people identify with you because when you look at these clubs, you know, in Europe, uh, every day that you wake up, even when we had uh, a worldwide lockdown, these clubs were producing content from before. And it goes back to what Dr. Gerard was saying about telling our own stories. Uh, yesterday in Uganda, there's a player who scored um, a hat-trick and he's a defender. 
And so we were having an online discussion and trying to remember when is the last time a defender scored a hat trick in the Uganda Premier League? And we had to go all the way to 1985. But if you ask us journalists that are covering African football, do we know our stories? Do we have statistics on this continent? You know, um, when is the last time maybe a defender was uh, the, the leading top scorer of a league in Africa? You know, so things like that. We, we want to tell these stories, but we don't have statistics. We don't have the infrastructure. We really don't have anything to do uh, with the entire setup. And just to conclude, Dr. Gerard talked about, um, you know, super sport in Nigeria and Ghana. When you talk about the success of the PSL, you have to look at um, uh, the economy of a country. We, we must not forget that because uh, how does Mamelodi Sundowns, Kaiser Chiefs and Orlando Pirates, how do they manage to have a car uh, company as, as a partner or as a sponsor? You know, uh, you have Toyota, you have Nike, uh, Adidas, Puma signing up with all these big clubs. Can they do the same in, uh, in Kenya? Can they do the same in Ethiopia? And if not, why? Why can why can they not go to those markets because those markets have uh, a big population, uh, but also what is um, the spending um, capability of an individual on a daily uh, on a daily you know basis? Uh, for example, a normal person in Sub-Saharan Africa, how much do they spend in a day? Can they afford to buy a jersey that is uh, ten dollars? Can they afford to transport themselves to the stadium or to go for an away game? These are things that football leaders need to discuss uh, and understand really that football is a business. It's not just about the 90 minutes, let's play. Let's pay the salary of uh, the coaches and the players, uh, transport the players to the stadium. How do you think outside the box and make money as a club, as a federation, as uh, you know, an entity? But it has to bring all the stakeholders together to have these discussions. Thank you that, uh, for that, uh, Asha. I, 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 will, I will stay with you for a bit. Uh, and uh, uh, when it comes to this uh, very important uh, issue of telling our stories, you have uh, mentioned and congratulations for covering African sport uh, extensively. Uh, from a personal, uh, personal experience, how is it working as a... Um, uh, in, uh, in in the, in the sector where a lot of the content is dominated by European football, for example. And how do you encourage other African journalists to work in this space? Well, to be honest, uh, for me, it was personal initiative uh, right from the beginning. I told myself that I want to be the face of uh, African football. I want to be the one telling our own stories. Uh, because, uh, you know, if you look at any sector in the world, uh, people are telling our stories as Africans. And sometimes they're not accurate because they don't have context. They don't understand where we are coming from as a people. I take you to the entertainment uh, industry. When you look at the power that uh, Black Panther had on the this generation and you have black kids watching um, you know black actors and actresses uh, shining a light on this continent it's really beautiful and and for me that's what I want to tell and the encouragement that I give to other African uh, journalists is that you have to love yourself before you start telling other people's stories because if you sit down and say um you know ateta today did not play x y and z okay uh first of all were you at the training practice uh did you attend the video session or uh do you have an insider on arsenal that you're getting this kind of information or not you know uh, but if i go and watch al ahli training if i know uh the head of media at al ahli if i know uh, the head of video analysis at uh, kaiser chips if I know the marketing manager at Asek Mimosas, if I know someone at Diambas in, in Senegal, it's easy for me to directly uh, ask them 
what's happening, you know, in Diambas? How many players have you, uh, you know, included in your under-17 team that's going to play at the AFCON in Morocco? Why is it that Diambas is the one that is having all these players, you know? These are some of the things that it's easy for me to access information at that level and then to relay it to... Uh, the audience that is uh, Africans uh, or even just really the world. And and for me, um, it's not difficult. You know, we just have to be open-minded to rethink about, you know, the sacrifices that also our forefathers, you know, had to make. And, and it's really part of um, uh, that conversation that we're fighting this colonization. And like it or not, people don't want to have that conversation and to say, ah, oh, you know, European football, um, the pitches are nice, uh, the stadiums are cool, there are so many fans there. Yes, it's nice to see, no problem. But how do we also promote our own football here in Africa? How do we sell our brothers? Because we are part of the ecosystem. Uh, that leads to the development of African football. It's not been easy, by the way, uh, but for me personally, something that I can share with my brothers and sisters is that um, I, I'm a linguist. I speak uh, so many languages, uh, about 18, and I'm trying... Sorry, I think we lost you. He's frozen. He's frozen for a bit. Maybe we'll just take a few questions as we uh, get to the end. And uh, uh, there is one from uh, Wycliffe where, where Kessa, how can Africa harness the power of the media to develop African football? I think the radio have answered this, but just to reiterate as we get to the end. Oh, to read. Yes, I think uh, the power for media should be the power of football or the power of football should be the power of media it is collaborative work uh they have to go side by side hand in hand to be able to do it not media wants to make money out of football that's not going to happen anytime soon uh, but football growing up and doing much better media can make money out of it and that's how it has to be uh, analyzed and uh and looking also super sport put effort being sport is investing at some extent we have the chinese today and canal plus what drive their business it is international sport their interest is not going to generate much <coughs> it's not going to be generated by uh, african sport itself but the local media who are they are there a private one the government one, they can a little bit invest a little bit more and be closer to local sports, not to make money, but to get content such a way that they can be uh, along when these sports organizations are growing. That's what we, we need to do. It's a long uh, work together. It's a long work together. Thank you. We we'll take another question from Von Von. Maybe uh, Asha, you can take this because as you continue with your personal experience, I love the discussion. Well done to the organizers. I've answered the question of selling countries' leagues. How do you sell very small clubs in these countries? Again, about telling our stories. Asha is still frozen. How do you how do you sell uh, small clubs? Mm -hmm. uh, we have to put things in. Sorry, I'm back. Yeah, now can you hear me? You. Sorry. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. What What did you? Uh, Brian, could you please repeat the question? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it says, how, how do we sell very small clubs in these countries in terms of media coverage, telling our stories? Well, I think that uh, that's a very good question. Uh, first of all, because when you're a small club, 
not so many people are willing to tell your story because uh, it's the bigger clubs that bring in the numbers, if that makes sense. If you look at, uh, for example, um, you know, the Egyptian league, um, it's Al-Ahli and Zamalek, like literally all the time. If you look at the content, the media content there, uh, everything is always about those clubs. Um, so no one is trying to tell the story of, for example, a club like Smuha or Ismailia. Um, if they do, it's, you know, once in a while. So these small clubs, what they can do is to create their own content. They need to use social media to tell their own stories. Um, there's YouTube, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have Instagram, um, LinkedIn, anything you can think about to tell your own stories and generate your own income. The problem we have in African football right now is that small clubs do not want to invest in uh, communications and marketing. And by doing that, they are taking away uh, an opportunity to actually tell their own stories and also to make money. Because there's a whole platform there online for uh, for them to get sponsorship, by the way, even just through views. Because if you build um, uh, the momentum from that uh, point of view, it, it's just you know very important because it just keeps doubling up and tripling eventually. When you look at AS Roma right now, AS Roma is literally in their past days. You can describe them as a small club uh, from a performance point of view. I mean, on the pitch. But if you look at AS Roma and the online game, as I may call it, they have thousands and millions of followers online just because they are reacting to the times. For example, you cannot believe it that AS Roma have a Twitter account in Swahili. So they are forcing themselves in East Africa and saying we are going to go into that market if a club like Gormahia or AFC Leopards or Tasca or uh, KCCA from Uganda or Vipers are not willing to enter that market. You know, and they're saying we're going to go out there and think outside the box and enter your market if you're not thinking. So the small clubs in Africa need to uh, see where are they right now, identify themselves. Um, get the few funds that they have and push from all angles. You know, in Uganda, we have a good example, uh, a club called Wakiso Giants. They're a small club started by, uh, you know, someone who is uh, an investor, very young, vibrant, uh, intelligent, and he's, you know, trying to push a lot of online content, going out to all these companies and saying, um, what can we do together? Even if it's not really uh, them bringing in the money, but um, they're partnering on something, maybe they're giving away goods or something, but uh, there's also engagement online. Um, and that helps a lot, you know, uh, for people to know the club, but also for them to get more sponsorship uh, and, and invest in their, uh, in their identity. And in the next five years or so, I'm sure that they will have uh, bigger and bigger uh, uh, partnerships and sponsorships. Okay, uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll end it here. We are just after the hour mark. And uh, I would like to take your concluding remarks. And um, yeah, we'll start with you, uh, Gerard, this time. And then we'll conclude with you, Asha. Okay, uh, first, uh, thanks you for having me here again. Uh, there's a lot to say about this topic. We just cover a little bit of it. We didn't talk about the the future with uh, for mm -hmm. uh, what uh, African sport can do with uh, new technology mm -hmm. and new media. We haven't scratched that uh, element yet. And I think uh, for me, it is the it's the mindset first. What do we where do we want to to be, and who do we want to be? It shouldn't be defined by anyone else than ourselves and uh, media and sports have to work together and define what we, they want to be together, not separately. And that will make the difference and start thinking more and more uh, with what we have and what we can, we can build with what we have instead of being running after what we are not going to reach because we don't have the foundation for it yet. Mm -hmm. Asha. 
Well, first of all, uh, like Dr. Jared said, thank you very, very much, Brian, for hosting us. Um, this is part of the solutions, by the way. As you talk about the problems of um, African football and the business of uh, business side of it, this platform right here is one of the solutions, and you're doing an incredible job. So thank you very much for having us. Uh, well, for me, the takeaway really is um, uh, it comes down to leadership. You know, we need people who are in positions to have uh, visions and bigger, clearer pictures um, of African football. And every stakeholder for me has to be involved in the process. So we are talking about the Confederation of African Football. We're talking about the national federations in Africa. We're talking about the clubs. We're talking about the media, the fans, the players. For example, I cannot say that I'm a fan of African football and I have never spent money to buy a jersey in Africa. I need to be able to get my own hard earned money and say, I'm going to go and buy an Esperance de Tunis t-shirt. I'm going to go and buy uh, Kaiser Chiefs. I'm going to buy uh, Tengwath or Asek Mimosas. I need to be able to do that to be part of the solution and not to just say, oh, how many retweets on Twitter for me to get a jersey, you know? So uh, these are some of the things that we need to talk about. And the media plays a key role by reminding by being in the faces of people, uh, because we have followings, I should say, on social media and people who follow what we say and what we talk about. So when we keep reminding them about this message, that's how we bring change. Even if every day you impact two people online, uh, because that's where everyone is, everyone is on their phone, um, that, that's that's some progress that we are making. And, and uh, that's what this show is doing by being part of the conversation, by bringing people from different worlds together. Because uh, before this, I did not know Dr. Gerard, but wow, we have a, a, a great mind with such immense experience like him and you, Brian, as well. So, and so many other people that I've seen in the comment section that have been following this conversation. So um, all stakeholders have to be involved. We have to move together and support each other uh, for the greater good. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. As uh, we said, here is where we create the conversation and we hope going forward we can action whatever it is that we are talking about here. We just don't want to keep talking about or complaining about what is happening in Africa. We also need to come up with uh, solutions or ideas on how we can, we can build the ecosystem uh, here. Uh, talking about leadership, Asha, next week is a very crucial week for African football. We have the CAF General Assembly and uh, the elections there. So on Monday, we have a special session on uh, CAF elections. So I hope you'll be, you will be watching. We'll make the announcement and uh, we'll be discussing really what, um, what's on the plate for the next leadership of, uh, of CAF. There's been a lot of intrigues at, uh, at that level and uh, we're all aware of this. But it's high time we also start discussing these things openly so on monday 8th uh, of march we'll be having a special session of the africa football business show discussing uh, the CAF uh, elections uh, so thank you very much uh, once again gerard and uh, asha for taking the time to be with us and uh, we're looking forward to hosting you again as gerard said we've just touched the surface and there's a lot to be discussed in future and to be actioned and uh, i'll take this opportunity once again to thank our sponsors uh, otb africa uh, Padmas and uh, See Beyond Leadership Forum for making this uh, possible, and of course our collaborators, uh, Sports uh, Legal. And to our audience also, thank you very much for joining us for this uh, episode, and we welcome you to join us on a future episode, and always feel free to share your comments, uh, ideas, views on whatever we are doing. We are always open uh, to explore uh, conversations that can really move uh, football uh, forward and sports really in general football is just our our beacon but this can influence all other sports as my two guests today are from basketball so you can imagine uh, the power of football has on the continent all right thank you and uh, see you guys uh, next time thank you very much for having us Bye.